Good evening, friends. We are on live. It's so nice to see everyone. I hope everyone had an amazing 4th of July weekend. I'm so happy to be back with you. And we are studying tonight a really cool, I would think a little underrated person in the Bible. And so he has a name and his name is Gideon. Now Gideon is a judge and we find this story in Judges chapter 6. But a lot of times he is very underrated. So I read this story so many times. But again, as I was preparing and reading, I just came to tears because I could really see the goodness of the Lord in this story. And this isn't just a fairy tale story. This is real life. So journey together with me tonight as we look at Gideon and his amazing journey of Gideon in the battle of 300. Amen. And so let's open up in prayer. Lord God, we thank you so much for tonight. I thank you for everyone tuning in and those who will catch the recording after, Lord God. I pray special blessings upon every single person. You say you will be blessed when you hunger and thirst for righteousness. So many things of the world can give you a temporary fix or a temporary happiness, but we know that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Lord, we come to you. We thank you. We come um, with repented hearts, Lord God. We ask that you minister to us tonight. May it be your words, Holy Spirit, and not mine. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So today's study is called An Unlikely Hero. An Unlikely Hero. Because that's what God does. He loves to take credit and glory and he uses the people that you least expect. So many times um, we we'll say, really? Him? Her? God used them? Wait. Oh, it's just her. It's just him. Well, let me tell you, friends, it's not just her or just him because our ways are not God's ways and our thoughts are not his thoughts. And so we can never jump to conclusions. We can't judge because the Lord knows what he's doing and he's going to use anyone that he wants to. And, and honestly, you have no say because he's God and he's in control. Amen. And that's what happens in this uh, story. I once had a dream. I'll share this with you real quick just to start off. That's something I had uh, believed for for a very long time had come true. In the dream, it, it had come to pass and it came true. And in the dream, I was almost to the point of like crying and crying because I couldn't believe that, that it actually happened, that it actually came true. And Jesus appears next to me like so many times in my dream. And he smiled and he said, what's the matter? You look shocked. And I said, well, I have been up all night because I couldn't sleep in, in amazement that you picked me, that, that you chose me, you know, that this came true. And Jesus chuckled, laughed in the dream as he was smiling. And he said, why do you find it so hard to believe? And in that moment, in my spirit, I knew that God is the one who qualifies. God is the one who does that, my friends. God is the one who qualifies. And he qualifies the one that he chooses to call. God is the one who qualifies the one he chooses to call. So nothing in this earth that according to our standards, everything you can type up in your resume, everything that you can have a reference for in the supernatural, it doesn't really matter because it's what God says about you. It's how God sees you. And everything revolves around his thoughts and his ways and the way he is going to go about everything. And in Gideon's case, you know, it was kind of like in my dream. It is the God, the one who justifies uh, according to his purpose. And all the lies that you may have believed your entire life just really don't matter when God steps in, friends. When God has something to say, 
That's all that matters because he has the final say. And he, every lie completely fades away. And everything that you've ever believed about you completely fades away when God calls you. And that's what happens in the story of Gideon. And in Gideon's case, that's also what mattered. It's just so hard to believe that um, God had chosen him. And God saw his insecurity and his lack of confidence. And that was okay because God does reassure Gideon. And he, be and he tells him, you know, I know it's hard to believe, but I'm going to be with you. I've called you. I have a plan for you. And I've chosen you. Yes, you Gideon. Everyone that, you know, looked at you like, you didn't matter is really going to have a laugh now because that's the one I'm choosing. You, Gideon. The person that in the natural, friends, he tells God, we'll read here. He says, my family is the weakest out of all the clans. And if anything, I'm even the least of all of them. He's telling him, you know what they say about me, God? People around town throughout the cities, they know me and they laugh at me. I'm actually a loser, you know, like what the world deems as a loser or what you think is pathetic. Friends, I'm telling you, God has the final say and it's only what he says that matters. And so we're going to look at that tonight that no matter all the voices and everyone around you that may be, uh, you know, saying this or that about you, just drown it out. Just really in your heart, take it in and know that only what God has to say truly matters. Amen. And so don't ever listen to anybody or anything because they that will come your way. I, I know it's come my way. I've shared it many times before. And it's okay. It's okay if people talk about you because at the end of the day, you're giving an account to him only. And it only matters what God has to say. And so if the world sees you as a loser, as weak, as pathetic, as unpopular, as not doing this or not fitting in, that's okay. Because God can use you in mighty ways. And everyone who laughed at you is going to come back and is going to be very, very surprised. And so as a brief introduction, as a reminder before uh, the holiday, we got into the book of Judges. So we know that after Joshua, the Israelites crossed over into the promised land. The promised land that the Lord had promised many generations ago to Father Abraham, his descendants. God used Moses as the deliverer of the Israelites and they entered the promised land. And so me, these people now in the book of Judges are the generations after, meaning they forgot how good the Lord was um, to their parents, their grandparents, their great grandparents. They forgot how God used Moses in a mighty way to deliver their ancestors. They had forgotten how the Lord moved mightily and they were kind of pretty much spoiled and they were very ungrateful people. And they they had not suffered the way that their ancestors had suffered. And so now in the book of Judges, they're doing their own thing. They're doing whatever they feel like doing. It sums up a lot of what we see in the world, right? They, they justify their own actions. They do whatever they think is right, whatever they feel like doing, whatever looks pleasing in their eyes to their flesh. They satisfy the pleasures of whatever occurs to them. The lust of the eye, the greed, the selfishness, whatever it is. And that's what they began to do. And so things went well for them. So they had forgotten about the Lord. So many of us can relate, right, where things are going good in our life and we kind of forget about God, right? We're not praying as much or we're not reading the word or going to church or just fellowshipping with everyone else. You're kind of just like doing secular things, doing things that the world does, right? Because everything is going smooth and great. So you forget about the Lord. So that's what happens with them. They begin to see the neighboring people groups and how they lived unholy 
and their pagan uh, practices, uh, such evil in their own lustful, selfish ways, sexual immorality, perversion, greed, very secular. You know, what the world says right now is okay. What the world says right now, it, there's nothing wrong with it. Well, that's what was going on there. But you see, that's not what the Lord said, but they had forgotten that. So many times, even as Christians, um, we also begin to forget about the Lord and we begin to participate in the way that the people that don't know the Lord, you know, we call it the secular world. Uh, we begin to also live in that way. And sometimes it's a gradual process. And all of a sudden we find ourselves just acting just as foolish as they are. And so many times we're blinded and we don't see it until something really bad happens. God has to really knock us over the head. And we begin to lose our moral compass, our values, and we begin to just look no different from them. We live the way we want, do what we want, say what we want, whenever we want. And that's exactly what the Israelites did. And because of their disobedience, the Lord continued to deliver them into the hands of their enemies. They really began to reap the consequences of their actions. Um, when everything was going wrong in their lives, when it got to the point where they couldn't handle it anymore, when it got to the point where they just couldn't go on anymore that way, they would cry out to God. Then they would remember God. Then they said, Mm, you know, I think what we're doing is wrong. We need to repent. Well, you think because sometimes it's a little too late, but the Lord in his graciousness, in his goodness, he always remembered the Israelites. He always remembered them. And that's what the Lord does, my friends. No matter how many times we fall, how many times we fail, just know that the Lord always will remember you. Cry out to him a million times. It doesn't matter. It's the loving kindness of the Lord that draws us to repentance. That's what it is, friends. It's not all the time him bashing and bashing and all. It's the loving kindness of the Lord. And so every time they would cry out to the Lord, whenever things would go bad, God would raise up a leader, which is a judge. God would raise up a, a judge, a leader, who is kind of seen like a governor, right? A political leader, actually. Um, a governor, a general, even in times of battle, that would rule the people and everyone would listen to this judge, this leader. And they were also a prophet. So the Lord would speak to this judge, to this leader, and they were also giving the message from the Lord. They served as prophets. So one of the last judges that we're going to get into is Samuel. And Samuel was a prophet. Deborah, we talked about last time, she was a prophetess. Here, you see what a prophet is. A prophet is a mouthpiece for the Lord. God uses people and gives them prophetic words as messages to deliver to the people. And so God would um, come to this judge and would give them a message. And as Israel would then listen, God would deliver them. And it became a constant pattern back and forth, back and forth. And now I personally really, as I said in the beginning, love the story of Gideon because it shows the grace of God. The might and the power of the Lord, how he can use anyone. He can use what the world deems as weak as a loser, as pathetic, as in irrelevant, insignificant, because that's what the Lord does. He uses the least likely. The unlikely hero is who the Lord chooses. And so the Lord is the one who justifies. The Lord is the one who gets to choose who he wants to use. And in 1 Corinthians 1 27, Paul writes exactly what we see in the story of Gideon. He says that God uses the unlikely right? The, the, the ones that no one thinks is worthy enough. He uses the foolish things, right? The, the weak things of the world. He uses the things that the world sees as insignificant or foolish, but he uses that to humble what the world sees as cool or popular, to humble kings and queens, to humble what the world sees as 
what's in. That's what God does. It's quite the reverse. And when we really understand that it's quite the opposite, there's going to be so much deliverance with people who struggle with anxiety and depression and the lack of not being able to fit in and the, and the want to, to be able to look like the world and participate in the things of the world. Once we understand, and I'm not saying that, you know, it's easy to not feel that way. But once we truly understand that it's only the Lord's way that matters, life is going to be much easier, much, much easier. And so again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And so I'm in Judges chapter 6. And it says here, because of that, he handed them over to the Midianites because of the power of uh, because of the power of Midian, it, they were so oppressive. The Israelites prepared shelters for themselves. I'm in verse 2. In mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds, whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel. They were being bullied. They were being bullied by these people. Neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them on their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. You see, that's what the enemy does. He impoverishes you. He leaves you broke and miserable. He leaves you broken on the inside out. For the temporary pleasures of the world, you know, we decide to go and to have fun and to live our life but in reality you are you are causing yourself to be impoverished you are living poor that's what you're doing when you're participating it doesn't matter even if your bank account has money when you are living like the world does you are actually living broke and poor because the enemy is sucking the life out of you and you don't even see it coming because you're so blinded with the pleasure that you're feeling and the temporary uh, satisfaction that you're feeling. That's what happened here to the Israelites. They didn't realize that the enemy was leaving them broken on the inside out out they were spiritually dead and physically they they began to lose everything because what did they do they traded a truth for a lie and that's what happens friends when we trade the truth for a lie we suffer consequences because we know better and some of us don't know better and that's why when you see someone that's acting a fool or you see someone that's making poor choices or they're making wrong decisions I urge you to pray for them that's why the Lord said father forgive them they don't they don't know what they're doing so many times I pray for people because I look at them and I just I'm hurting on the inside because they don't realize they are just drowning themselves, literally sometimes drowning themselves in pills and cigarettes and bottles and lust. They are losing their blessing and they don't even realize it. And it seems fun. Hey, look at me. I'm having a good time. But in reality, the enemy is secretly leaving you broken broken from the inside out. And you begin to lose, lose so much. You lose possible blessings that could come your way you lose the potential to live up to your incredible destiny the true calling and purpose that the Lord has for you and when the Israelites in verse 7 call out to the Lord because of Midian he sent them a prophet a lot of times people don't like prophetic words because they're not what they want to hear they're a bit harsh and they're telling them quite the opposite of they, what they want to hear. But the Lord's loving kindness is what, what happens when someone gives you a prophetic word. And the prophet says, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians. And I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you 
and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. Not listening to God it really does get you in trouble. I mean, I've been there. I feel like we've all been there at some point in our life. When you trade the truth for a lie, when you begin to despise truth, the voice of truth, there's going to be prophets and people in your life that are going to come to you and you're going to despise them because you're not listening to the voice of truth. You're justifying yourself in your own self-righteousness. But God uses prophets to warn us. And he even uses dreams and visions and words of wisdom, words of knowledge. But we refuse to listen and eventually it catches up. But here we go. They listened because God raised up a leader in his loving kindness. Because that's what draws us to repentance. The loving kindness of the Lord. And he raises up a leader, a unlikely hero, one who steps in and saves the day. And he uses someone that in the natural doesn't qualify as a mighty leader or warrior or someone that looks like they can deliver God's people. And that's why, like I said, this story is so encouraging because the truth is that so many of us are kind of tossed away. We're thrown to the side. You know, people and the world and people even in our job um, uh, environments have really, you know, done a, a number to our um, low self-esteem issues or our insecurity or lack of confidence, even family members. I mean, there's been so many times where, you know, people have been hurt and seen as unworthy or irrelevant. And God will use that person for that exact same reason. God so many times qualifies us because it is he who qualifies the one he calls. And, you know, our qualifications on earth are not what God sees. His contract papers, right, are written in tablets of stone forever they're written in heaven so it only matters what heaven has to say about you that's why paul says fix your eyes on things above not on the earthly things stop caring what people say about you when you're doing right and when you're serving the lord they let them keep laughing at you because even if the world sees you as weak God sees you as strong. And that's exactly what happens. And so in Judges chapter 6, uh, in verse 11, it is so beautiful because the angel of the Lord comes and pays a visit to someone who the world sees as a loser. Here we go. The angel of the Lord came and he sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash. Uh, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. So here he is like trying to hide food, trying to work. You know, he's just, they've just been so oppressed that they're living in constant fear. And we know that fear is not from the Lord. God doesn't want you to live in fear. And they have anxiety about the Midianites. And, and so the Lord himself, Jesus, the angel of the Lord, we know is Jesus. He appears in person. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you mighty warrior. Wow. So many times the angel of the Lord has appeared in the Old Testament. He appeared to Abraham. He appeared to Jacob. He appeared to Joshua. And now he appears to someone irrelevant. And now the world has labeled Gideon as weak. The world has labeled him as irrelevant. But you see, the labels God gives you are the ones that truly matter. And they're quite the opposite. The world gave uh, Gideon a label, a title, but here the Lord himself gives Gideon a new title, a new characteristic, a new quality, a new uh, trait. He calls him a mighty warrior. And now Gideon is shocked. He's seen the Lord 
no one has ever spoken to him that way. No one has ever referred to him as a mighty warrior. And so Gideon says, pardon me, my Lord. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where all of his wonders, uh, where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring you out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. You know, sometimes we honestly feel that same way that Gideon is talking about here. We feel hopeless, abandoned. That's what Gideon is saying. You know, the Lord says he's never going to leave you or forsake you. The Lord will always be with you. But we feel abandoned right now. Where is God? Look at me. I'm hiding here alone. I'm working, afraid for my life, for the survival of my family. At any given day, the Midianites can come and just plunder everything we have and take my livestock, take my home, even kill us. How, how can this be? How are you standing here? calling me a mighty warrior. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of the hands of Midian. I am sending you, right? Am I not sending you? The Lord kind of simply ignores a little bit of what Gideon is saying. And he's just calling him strong. He's calling him a mighty warrior. He is giving him a command. He is giving him a mission. He is telling him, hey, you have a command. You have a mission. You need to go and save Israel. And the only thing that matters in this life is when God is with you. And that's what he says. Am I not with you? Am I not enough, Gideon? I am standing right here and I am more than enough. And it is with me that you are more than a conqueror. And no one or nothing can stand in your way when God is with you. No power in the natural or in the supernatural, like they say, no power in hell can stop you. Nothing can stand in your way because I am the Lord God and I am with you. Gideon says again, you know, I could just see him because he always, you know, said, you know, I I'm weak, right? So he is a little bit insecure. He, he lacks in confidence. It's probably, like, excuse me, sir. Um, <laughs> it was probably that kid in the classroom, right? That didn't want to, to talk or raise their hand. So he says in verse 15, pardon me, my Lord, but how can I? Save Israel. My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. Gideon says, Okay, Lord, but I'm sorry. There's a problem here. I'm basically a nobody, and my family's not even important. And if anything, I'm actually the least important in my family. And uh, nobody really cares about me or knows me. Um, I, a lot of people laugh at me when they even see me go by. I'm very insignificant. No one really takes me seriously. Uh, you can't expect me to go and tell everyone, hey, the Lord's about to use me to go save all of Israel. They're probably going to laugh at me, Lord. Oh, this guy here? God chose him to deliver us? I mean... They're just going to make fun of me. I can already hear it right now. And some of us have been at this point before in our lives where even our own family members laugh at us or disregard us or see us as insignificant or unimportant. And even in your job or, you know, your circle of friends, even at church, this could happen where no one really takes you seriously. And maybe you have so much to bring to the table, but but you are just seen as that that guy over there or that girl over there but you see God reassures him that he's going to be with him that he's going to take down the entire Midian group the Lord answered I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites leaving none alive Gideon replied I now if now I have found favor in your eyes give me a sign that 
it is really you talking to me. Like, I'm not here going crazy. I'm not hallucinating because of all my worry and anxiety, right? This is really happening. Little old me, right, Gideon, the weakest one, the insignificant, the irrelevant one, the loser of the family and of the town is really talking to the Lord right now. You're really commanding me to go save all Israel. He says, don't go away, Lord until I come back and bring my offering and I set it before you. And the Lord says, I will wait till you return. Imagine you just being right there with Jesus and he's just sitting there by the tree, just waiting, saying, oh, Gideon, if you only knew that I use the least of these to get glory from. And so here, Gideon is acting like an, in his normal state of mind. His, he was human. In his humanity, it was really hard to believe that God wanted to use him. Because in the natural, it was impossible. He was older, right? He was a grandpa. You'll see, like, later, he, it says that he, you know, he, he didn't really have much to offer. He's the weakest one. He's unpopular. He's a nobody. He's insignificant. And so his whole life, he has gone around believing that. And now the Lord is telling him he's a mighty warrior, that he's about to use him to deliver Israel. Come on, in the natural, he needed a sign. He needed a confirmation that, you know, to believe the words that the Lord was telling him that he was a mighty warrior. And so sometimes we find it hard to believe, as I shared in the beginning, my dream that we find it hard to believe that God wants to use us because it does seem impossible so many times. It's hard to believe, you know, it's okay to ask God for signs and confirmation. That's exactly why this, this story is told from thousands of years ago, because I, I know people and I do it all the time. We ask God for confirmation. We ask God to give us a sign. We ask the Lord like, is it really you? And that's just simply having faith. That's just simply saying, all right, God, I want to trust you. I'm going to put my complete faith in you. And the Lord says back in return, I have no problem giving you a sign because the Lord sees our humanity. The Lord sees that in the natural, it's hard to to believe God for so many things, especially when it seems impossible. So Gideon goes inside, prepares a young goat. He made breast, bread without yeast. And he puts the meat in a basket and it's broth in a pot. He brought them out and he offered them under the oak tree. The angel of God, verse 20, Judges 6, 20. Take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock, he says, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. The angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread. We saw this before in the story of Abraham. The Lord passed through with his consuming fire. And then the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord. And called it, the Lord is peace. And so friends, you have to understand the Israelites lived in constant fear. They lived in anxiety and fear. And now the Lord of peace is here with Gideon telling him that everything is going to be okay. Fear not. Have faith. And so in Exodus, God tells Moses, right? If you see my, see me. If you see my face, you will die. And so this has been passed down. And that's why Gideon says, I I've seen the Lord face to face. And he assures him, you're not going to die. Friends, you can see the Lord face to face. Remember, Moses would talk to him all the time. And the glory was so strong that they had to ask him to put a face covering right? Like a face mask over him because the glory was so uh, sp uh, splendid. 
And so Jesus also tells Philip in John 14, when Philip asks to see the Father, he says, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. And Jesus says, if you've seen my face, you've seen the face of God. So my friends, Gideon is here and, and it's very deep, the Godhead. And I'm not going to go into that. That's definitely a topic for another day. But the Lord is with Gideon. And that same night, the Lord speaks to him again and says, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the pole beside it, the Asherah pole. They were serving pagan foreign gods and idols. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top of this height, using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down. Offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So good, Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than the daytime. Some people say, oh my God, why would God use such a coward like Gideon? He wasn't even brave. Why is God using him? You can't say that. The Lord called him a mighty warrior. Even though, look, he was kind of a wimp, right? Because he was so, like, unpopular. He even had to do it at night so people won't see him. And, and that was okay for the Lord. So it doesn't matter, friends. Even if you kind of are a little bit afraid, a little bit of um, a wimp, you know, uh, God sees that. Because bravery comes from the heart and the Lord is your strength. They asked who did this. When they carefully investigated, they were told that Gideon had done it. They're like, he did it. And so they wanted to bring him out and kill him. That's how blinded they were. This guy is trying to tear down the altar to a false god. And because of that, they want to kill him. But Joash replied to the crowd, are you going to plead Baal's cause? Like he's like, are you really going to defend Baal, a false god? Are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. If Baal is really God, he can defend himself when someone breaks down his altar. So someone, there's always that one person, right, that's more brave that will stand up for you. So because Gideon broke down Baal's altar, they gave him the name. They changed his name to Jerubal, saying, let Baal contend with him. They were so blinded, friends. And so at this time, all the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the other Eastern people, they joined forces and they crossed over the Jordan and they camped in the Valley of Jezreel. Then the spirit of the Lord came on Gideon, that Holy Spirit, the one that was on David that we're going to see. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. The one that Isaiah exclaimed that Jesus quotes, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead comes upon Gideon and he blew a trumpet summoning those to follow him. All of a sudden, he just became so bold and brave because the Lord was with him. He sent messengers throughout Manasseh, calling them to arms and also into Asher and Zebulun and, and Nephtali so that they too went up to meet him. Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. Look, there, he needs another sign. He's like, okay, okay, this is really happening right now. I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece and all the ground, uh, all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand as you save. So he wants to put a fleece and all of the ground, right? That's what he says. If there's dew on the fleece only, but the ground around it is dry, that's my sign. You're about to use me, God. You are with me. That's my sign. And that is exactly what happens. And it says that in verse 38. Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. He said, I'm going to give you all the dew you want in the world, Gideon, and that ground will be dry just, to, just for you to know that 
I am with you, that I have called you, that I have qualified you, and that I'm the one who is going to be with you throughout this whole journey. Then Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me, God. Let me just make one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece, but this time make the fleece dry and let the ground be covered with dew. Wow, that's pretty intense. You might say, well, Gideon is pretty bold and brave to ask that of God. You see, friends, the thing with Gideon is his whole life, he has gone around just feeling so oppressed, feeling unimportant, irrelevant, insignificant. He really was like afraid, but then at the same time believed. It was that moment, I believe, but help my unbelief. He had faith, but he just needed more because, you know, God was asking a big thing of Gideon. And, and you have to understand, he didn't have the, the, the security and the confidence and the bravery that so many other people had. So many other people, God could have called them, that they were actually mighty warriors in the physical. And so that night, God did so. Only the fleece was dry. All the ground around was covered with dew. So Gideon asked the Lord for these signs, for confirmation. And God did that because God sees the heart, friends. God saw Gideon's heart. Gideon really wanted to follow what God wanted him to do. He did, and that's why he went with it. But in the natural, he was a little bit afraid. And God tested him, and he tested God back. Isn't that funny? God tests his faith. And Gideon tests God back. It's okay to do that because that just shows you that you trust God, that you believe in God, that you that you are willing to do whatever God wants you to do. And so it was normal for Gideon to do this. And so Gideon has that reassurance because that's what God does. He encourages us. And that's what God does when he gives you dreams or visions or when he uses someone to give you a prophetic word. A lot of times, it's just for encouragement. And so in the next chapter, Judges 7, early in the morning, Gideon and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Moreh. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands. I can just like see God doing this right now. And you have too many. I can't do it. You have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me, they will say. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. So this was a great test of Gideon's faith. His army of 32,000 men was already overmatched. The Midianites had about 135,000. 135,000 men compared to just 32,000 men. Yet God thought his army was too big. And he commanded Gideon to invite all of those who were afraid to leave. And he was only left with 10,000 men. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6 tells us that it is not, it is not by our might nor by our power, but it is by his spirit, says the Lord. You know, sometimes we as humans are guilty of taking credit for things that God does. We, we become proud and arrogant. We grow boastful and conceited when it was never your victory because you have to remember your victory comes from the Lord. And so knowing the Israelites and knowing how stubborn and high-headed and proud that they are, the Lord said, I can't work this miracle. And you might say, come on, God, really? 135,000 to 32,000? It was still too much. Now there's 10,000. And it's still going to be too much. The Lord says that they're going to take credit for it. And we know that it is his strength. He is our deliverer. And so the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water. He, so the Lord is testing them now. The Lord is going to see 
who he's going to really use. I will thin them out there for you. If I say this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the man down to the water. Though there, listen to this friends, there the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. So they're at the river, whoever's drinking water from the creek, like a dog needs to be separated with those who kneel down with more class and drinks water and they go on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300 who took over the provisions and the trumpets of the others. So the ones who were a little bit less uh, classy, or sophisticated, those 300, yeah, those are the ones that God wanted to use. Those are the ones that God qualified. He said, those are the exact ones that I am going to use because remember, friends, God uses the insignificant, the irrelevant, the ones that you least expect. God uses the people that you least expect to humble the the wise. God uses the Foolish things, right? The ones that people may have laughed at them for the way they drank water. The ones that maybe were from the poor side of the town. The ones that weren't, uh, they didn't have servants of their own in their household. Those that drank water the way a dog drinks water is the one that God wanted to use to get the victory. Amen. I love that. If you think about it, that's pretty deep right there. He wanted to use the 300 men that drank water like a like an animal, like a dog, like an innocent dog that doesn't care about what people think or what people will say about them. So from an army of uh, 32,000 to 10,000 and now only to 300 men. And you know what's funny? If you think about it, the Lord didn't really even need those 300 men. But God was going to reward Gideon and these 300 men, because Gideon and these 300 men, the Lord told me this, were the ones that were the most insignificant, irrelevant, unworthy, unpopular people in that whole Israel. Yes, those men were the ones that were going to get the victory with God. Amen. And and, and God chose Gideon and these 300 men because God was going to lift them up. Everything that these men have gone through their entire lives, all the sufferings that they have gone through since their childhood, all the people making fun of them or all the times they've ever felt unworthy or that they didn't deserve something, that's exactly how God was going to reward them. They were about to get their victory. They were about to have their moment. That is the the ones that God uses, friends. And now the camp of Midian lay below him in the valley. During that night, whoa, this is also another one. It's it's not done. That's why I said I can't even rush this story. During that night, the Lord said to Gideon, get up, go against the camp because I'm going to give it into your hands. If you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura and listen to what they are saying. Afterward, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So he and Pura, his servant, went down to the outposts of the camp. The Midianites, the Amalekites, and the other eastern peoples had settled in the valley. Thick as locusts, their camels could be... could. Listen to this. Their camels could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. If you see that, wouldn't you be afraid? So the Lord knew Gideon had a little bit of fear still left in him. So he has to encourage him yet one last time. And then Gideon arrived at the outpost of camp just as a man was telling a friend his dream. He says, 
Gideon is overhearing, eavesdropping on this conversation. The friend tells another friend, I had a dream. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the midnight camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. His friend responded, this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash the Israelite. God has given the Midianite and the whole camp into his hands. When Gideon, who was eavesdropping, heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshipped. He returned to the camp of Israel. I could just see him right now, like shaking on the inside out, just trembling, just in awe of the Lord that he goes to the camp exactly when God tells him. And this guy is telling his friend a dream that he has. And he returned to the camp of Israel and called out, get up. The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. Dividing the 300 men into three companies, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. Once again, another confirmation, another sign. The Lord knew that there was still little fear in Gideon's heart. And God is so loving and patient. And he encourages Gideon by giving the enemy a dream. He gives this person on the enemy camp a dream. God wanted Gideon to find encouragement in this visit to the enemy's camp. This shows that when God asks us to do hard things for him, he doesn't fold his arms, right? Sit back and expect us to do it on our own. He is right with you, beside you through every single step of the way. He is there to guide you, to keep you, to encourage you throughout the entire journey. This is the loving kindness, grace, and mercy of God. He dealt with all of Gideon's fears and doubts, and that's what he will do for you. And here is something I find really, really interesting. Listen to this. A loaf of barley bread tumbled in the, into the camp of Midian in the dream. And listen, friends, this is really, really deep. Only the very poor ate barley bread during that time. Only poor people, really poor people ate barley bread. And that's what the enemy sees tumble into the, the camp and destroy them all. The vision, the dream, the vision meant that the camp of the Midianites would be knocked over by a humble nobody. Do you get that, friends? Isn't that amazing? Only very poor nobodies at that time, only poor people ate barley bread. And that is what the enemy sees that destroys their camp, the entire Midianites. A loaf of barley bread fell from the sky and completely collapsed the tent and destroys the Midianites. Who is that loaf of barley bread? It's Gideon and the 300 men that God is going to use. The 300 nobodies. But you see, they're not nobodies. That's the whole point. The world saw them as nobodies, but God saw them as exactly that somebody that God was going to use. Amen. I just find that beautiful and just so amazing. Barley was also um, food for dogs and for cattle. And it wasn't really used for men, but poor people had to use that. And so uh, the fact that God showed the enemy that barley bread is what destroyed the camp is truly deep. And it was no accident, right, that that man was telling him the dream at the exact same time that Gideon and his servant went up there. And so if you continue to read the story in Judges 7 and Judges chapter 8, Gideon defeats the entire Midianite army. I mean, they blow their trumpets. Um, they shout 
this is for the Lord and for Gideon. Gideon and the hundred men with him, because there were three companies, reached the edge of the camp at the beginning. And, and, and this is what's amazing. They blow their trumpets. They break the jars that they have, grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets. They, they shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. While each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran crying as they fled. It was only 100 there. I mean, when the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord, listen to this, caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. He caused confusion. The army fled this way and that way. You can continue to read in Judges chapter 7 and 8 and all of them ran away. Uh, Gideon captures the kings. He gets the complete victory. And it's um, kind of funny in Judges chapter 8, which you have to read on your own to see how the story ends. Uh, Gideon and his army continue to pursue the Midianites and the king, all of them across the Jordan. You can read that on your own. They're going... And they actually run in run into two people groups that refuse to also give them some nourishment because he asks them, you know, my army, we're thirsty, we're hungry, and they refuse. And Gideon says, I'm going to come back for you. After I get the victory there on my way back, you're going to have to deal with me and the Lord because you refuse me and my men food. I mean, the bravery in Gideon, and that's exactly what happens. And so we are encouraged today to continue to have faith when God tells you to do something that's unrealistic, unattainable, impossible in the natural, something you never thought could happen, you have to believe. And if you need to ask God for signs and confirmation, do it. It is so worth it. God uses the least of these, the unlikely heroes, the insignificant nobodies, what the world sees as losers, what the world deems as unpopular God is the one who qualifies the called. Amen. And that is why God gets the entire glory in this story. And, and, and afterward, they even want to serve Gideon. They want to make him their ruler. And Gideon says, nope. The Lord is your ruler. That's who you are going to serve. Amen. And so as we close out tonight, I want to encourage you. Uh, do not underlook the story of Gideon. I mean, it's so deep. And, and the relationship that God has with Gideon, someone who was filled with fear and anxiety, someone who didn't act like he needed to act, someone who the, the world, the town, the people saw him as weak, the least of these. That is who God used. And so all the lies that have been fed to you, just right now in the name of Jesus, I cast them out. Begin to renew your mind. The Lord is calling you mighty warrior. That is what he called Gideon, mighty warrior. The Lord will equip you. The Lord will empower you. The Lord will give you all the tools and the resources that he needs you to have because he is the one who will call you, set you apart, use you. He will walk with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. And he will continue to empower you. And he loves you. He has a plan and a purpose for you, just like he did with Gideon. Amen. I, I wanted to touch into Samson, but I said I cannot rush this story. We are going to look at... Uh, the story of Samson, ah, who is who brings joy and tears to me at the same time. And that's how we are going to conclude the book of Judges next time with the story of Samson. And then we'll get into Samuel, who is our last prophet judge. Amen. I hope that you were blessed and encouraged. I pray that you continue to walk in faith and not fear. I love you and God bless you. See you soon. Bye.